Hello, hello, everybody. We're very excited uh, to have you here. My name is Lovis Maybatelein, and together with my colleague uh, Amir Masoud, uh, we would like to welcome you in the name of the Goethe Institute to this uh, third uh, food feature with the title Gastrophysics, the Art and Science of Multisensory Experience Design. For those who don't know the Goethe Institute, it is the German, uh, is the Culture Institute of the Federal Republic of Germany. This program is part of the global project, Culture and Creative Industries. And on behalf of the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, the BMZ, the GAZ and the Goethe Institute promote the emerging markets of culture and creative industries in Africa and the Middle East. The food features uh, are a series of weekly talks that focus on different aspects surrounding the topic of food design. It is the first whole program of our Food Week, which is an extensive program that seeks to encourage the development of practical and theoretical knowledge about the emerging discipline of food design as part of the creative industries. For more details on the food fabric, as well as the food features, you can go on our website, Goethe Institute Jordan Food Fabric. So without further delay, I would like to introduce Aya Shaban, the moderator for the series. Um, Aya, is a, Aya Shaban is a food designer and architect. She's also the founder of the pioneering work food and lifestyle brand Namli that focus on traditional farming and wild ingredients. She has been in the field for more than eight years, designing innovative food products and multi-sensory learning tools that help reshape the culture of tomorrow. Welcome Aya, the microphone and screen are yours. Thank you, Lovis. Um, hello everyone. Uh, as Lovis said, I'm an architect and food designer uh, based in Amman. Very happy to be moderating this series of talks with remarkable designers and pioneers in the field of uh, food design. Please allow me first to bring your attention to a few guidelines. This session is recorded and will be shared publicly. So please turn off the, your video if you don't feel comfortable. Otherwise, it would be really great to see everyone's faces. Um, we have around 100 people registered today. So please keep your mics muted for the length of the talks. Um, you can type in your questions and comments in the chat throughout the session and we will open the stage for questions and answers in the last 15 to 20 minutes. Um, today we would love to run a poll uh, just for a few seconds. Don't think too much about the answers, just um, follow your intuition and um, the question will pop up on your screens. So please try to answer in 10 to 15 seconds. Nice, everyone is so quick. So we have, wow, people are entering as well. It will be really interesting to see how your answers will change by the end of this talk. Um, so we have six people more to go. Okay, that's very interesting. 16% um, answered. I'm going to share the results with you. 16%, 18% have answered that um, we can taste an image. 50% answered that we can taste color. 18% um, for shape and 14% for sound. So that's really interesting, especially that we will be talking about uh, sonic seasoning. Thank you everyone for answering. So um, today, we have two exceptional guests who will, who will touch upon one of the most interesting topics in the field, namely multisensory design. On one end, we have Dr. Professor Charles Spence, a distinguished figure in experimental psychology. 
His research calls for a radical new way of examining and understanding how our brains process the information from each of our different senses to create the rich multisensory experiences that fill our daily lives. His work had major implications for the way in which designers approach everything from products to interfaces and even the spaces in which we work and live. Um, his research focuses on how a better understanding of the human mind will lead to enhanced design, design outcomes in every field. Uh, his presentation will be followed by the talented sensory food designer, Laila Snevele, who had based a lot of her creative work on his groundbreaking research. Laila explores the interconnectedness of our senses, speculating possibilities which heighten our experience of food through physical and digital stimulation. I'm personally super excited about today's session, so I am pleased to extend a very warm welcome to our first speaker, Professor Charles Spence. The mic and screen are yours. Okay, hold on, let me get my optimize for video sharing. Screen sound is on. Uh, let's see if... So hopefully you can see a slide. Yes, we can. Good, and we will, off we go. And do tell me to uh, shut up if I get past my allotted <laughs> time. <laughs> Please, I won't feel offended. Um, so... Oh, no. Yeah. It is a pleasure to be here virtually um, this evening or this afternoon, where in the world we are, uh, to talk a bit about gastrophysics, the new science of eating, the title of a book from 2017 um, that really was my attempt to kind of bring together all the exciting stuff that I saw that was going on around the world of food and drink experience design. Uh, involving all the senses, because uh, I'm a multi-sensory psychologist by training. And I guess sort of focusing not so much on the food itself, uh, because I'm neither chef nor composer nor designer nor perfumer, but kind of on the everything else that surrounds our food and drink experiences. And one might sort of wonder why it is that a psychologist uh, should be interested in design, why psychologists should be interested in food experience. Um, but I think what I can bring to the table, uh, as it were, is some of the approaches from experimental psychology and neuroscience and some of the insights about how the brain connects the senses and some of the things that we often don't notice, but yet which the research can show fundamentally affect our perception, our behavior, our well-being, and so on. And thinking about them in the world of food, uh, food, after all, being one of the most multi-sensory things that we do. And it's not really true to say that um, there are no scientists working with food design. There are certainly many scientists working with food, um, but they tend to be working in food companies, doing sensory panel testing to figure out how much fish meal you can feed the chicken before you can taste the fish on the breast meat. It is science, it is about food, it's just not the sort of stuff that I'm interested in. I'm much more interested in sort of the more artistic creative end, um, working with designers and other uh, creative individuals and organizations in order to make the science of the senses as tasty as possible. So for example, we have one uh, dish shown here on the screen, a dish from uh, a young, uh, Anglo-Egyptian uh, chef Joseph Youssef from Kitchen Theory, a chef who I've been working with very closely for the last few years and whose work pops up now and again in the gastrophysics book. Uh, this is one dish from a menu from a few years ago called um, uh, Pollen and the Bee and it was part of a Mexico themed entomophagy menu where we tried, to, primarily him, but tried to encourage people to try insects in food, I'm not doing it because we said it was good for them or it's good for the environment for sustainability, but leading people in through the eye appeal of the dish. Hopefully you agree this looks like a, a dish one might want to eat, beautiful to behold. Um, and also through the senses, a dish that was sort of very, very tasty. And so you say, don't eat, said, eat insects because we say you should, but eat them because of, of you know, the sensory potential they can deliver to a, 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 your taste buds and your experience. Um, 
So I'm interested in doing sort of scientific studies around dishes like that, that are beautiful, that are uh, high end. Um, and the approach that, that I bring from Oxford, from the psychology department is probably more typically shown by the image of the blindfolded lady uh, smelling a drink in her glass. Uh, and this is very sort of highly controlled scientific research. Maybe we're interested in the question of whether the shape of the glass changes the taste of the drink. And we try and control everything very carefully. So this is very scientific research around design and flavor experience. It's just not very ecologically valid because this person is probably not, is definitely not enjoying uh, the drink that they can smell, but neither see nor touch nor taste. So we do some research there in the science lab, uh, very scientific, but we get criticized for being not very ecologically valid. And uh, we try and combine that research with real world studies in restaurants, bars, coffee shops, uh, food festivals, science festivals, music festivals, book festivals, any kind of festival where we can get lots and lots of people um, and give them something to taste, something to smell, something to feel, something to listen to and see how and if that changes their experience. Um, and if we can show the same sorts of factors affect people's perception of food in the lab and in the real world, then hopefully uh, that's going to be convincing to people. Um, and for me, I suppose that my sort of way in, I was never, I was always been interested in the senses, but never really in food. Um, but I think there are good grounds for thinking uh, that flavour is primarily a result uh, of what's going on in our brains. Um, and that very often uh, what one's trying to avoid in the design of food experiences is kind of the expression of those individuals we see in this slide who have got a, a slice of bread with something on top, which could be Nutella, I suppose, look brown and um, should be sweet. But clearly their facial expressions tell you all you need to know uh, that they are in fact pulling the uh, Marmite face. Uh, Marmite or Vegemite, this kind of umami, kakumi, yeasty spread, very salty, savory, sticky and black. Um, and these people, uh, consumers thought they were getting something sweet like Nutella. Instead, they got something savory and they pull this Marmite face. They will not forget this experience. They do not enjoy this um, highly designed food product uh, and nor will they enjoy it anytime soon after this first unpleasant encounter. And it was precisely this face, the Marmite face, as we call it, that the diners in the soon to be world's top restaurant, the Fat Duck in Bray, which is comfortably close to Oxford where I'm based, 40 minutes away by car on a good day, uh, where this dish was served by top chef Heston Blumenthal. Um, and at that stage about, 15 to 20 years ago, uh, when diners came to the restaurant, new dishes would sometimes be trialed in the kitchens. The kitchen staff would check they could scale the dish for service and store it and so on. And then the final step before a new food dish went onto the menu would be to test it with some of the regular guests in the restaurant. So here we have a dish that the chef thought was perfectly seasoned, that was good enough for his restaurant. He thought it tasted great. But when he served this dish to his guests in the restaurant, they pulled the marmite face and went, ah, it's disgusting, it's really salty. What's... And you want to say, what's gone wrong here? How can the world's best taste buds, in some sense, if you're the world's top chef, um, design something and give it to his guests in his restaurant who like his food, and yet they have, have an opposite reaction. Well, in this case, uh, the answer comes down to what's in the mind of the person or the persons doing the tasting. The chef knows that this is a historic savoury ice cream, actually a uh, frozen crab bisque or smoked salmon ice cream. So the colour is natural. The colour is perfect for the thing it portrays. But most of us, at least in the West, when they see something like this, a pink ice cream looking thing, our brains immediately predict that it's going to be raspberry or fruity blackberry kind of ice cream. It'll be sweet and fatty and delicious and not so good for us. Uh, and hence, when we get that expectation in mind, which our brains will make that prediction within within you know a few milliseconds of seeing food, that's what our brains have evolved for, our visual systems to find, predict, and attend to and follow energy dense sources of food uh, like this one through the environment. We expect it sweet, we get uh, savory, and you get the disconfirmation of expectation. You get the Marmite face. Um, 
And what I think this dish shows, and this is one that was uh, the chef was working on before I met him in 2003, uh, is that the pleasures of the table reside mainly in the mind and not in the mouth. And there's kind of a trick that our brains play on us that we all think we can taste in our mouths. I can, I can taste the, that my tea I was just drinking, it's there, the liquid in my mouth. And yet, in fact, when you study it scientifically, uh, that experience of flavor, e.g. of this ice cream, actually involves all the senses. It also involves your mood, your emotion, nostalgia, memories, so on and so forth. And all of that first comes together in the mind, not in the mouth. And it's a trick that our brain plays to project that sensation into the mouth after having combined everything we know about it and have predicted about that food in the brain. And it was this dish in particular then, I think got the chef uh, Heston Blumenthal interested in psychology and other sciences, realizing that it was not enough just to please his taste buds in the design of great food. He needed to know what was going on in the mind of his diners. And in this case, the research showed uh, from Martin Yeomans, another sus psychologist from Sussex, that if you call this dish food 386, or if you say this is a savory ice cream uh, on the menu, or when the waiter serves the dish, suddenly the diners know it's not strawberry ice cream anymore. And then when they taste it for the first time, they taste it as the chef intended, they taste it as the chef experienced, they love it then, and they're more likely to eat it thereafter. They don't even think it's salty anymore. Uh, once their mind is in the right place. So this is all well and good. This explains why some of the world's top chefs, those the molecular gastronomists, those working in modernist cuisine, uh, who have been applying a scientific approach in the kitchens of their restaurants with spumes and foams and gels and roto vaps and anti-griddles and all sorts of technology in the kitchen, why they've started only very recently to think about the science in the dining room, the science of the mind of their diner, that is the new science of eating, that is uh, the uh, gastrophysics. But while that interest from some of the world's foremost food designers uh, started out in the high-end restaurants, I think it's important to say, and it's my firm belief, that the best of this gastrophysics approach to food design that is uncovered in these kind of formula ones of the kitchen that are uh, restaurants like the Fat Duck um, do actually percolate down to the mainstream sooner or later. And one example of this would be something like this, the Patagonian toothfish, a dish, a fish uh, that is healthy, that is sustainable, that tastes good, that's easy to cook with. It just looks ugly. And this has been on menus for decades and no one ever ordered it. But in this case, just like in the ice cream, it's all about a matter of naming. And when some bright spark came up with the idea of calling this Chilean sea bass instead, Suddenly that sounds ah oh, so much more delicious and documented sales in pubs, gastro pubs, restaurants in the UK, North America, Australia and beyond went up 1200% simply by this change of naming. And if you want to nudge people's food behavior in a better direction to more sustainable for them or the planet, then maybe it's a, it's a gastrophysics, everything around the food and not just the food itself that we need to uh, concentrate on. Um, and for me, I guess, you know, well, on the one hand, all my research says all these things matter that people don't think believe matter. No one believes that the shape of the glass really has that much influence. Nobody believes that the colour of the lighting really changes the taste of food. Because it feels to me, like to all of us, like I can really taste what is in the glass. And yet for um, at the same time as thinking we taste in our mouth and we can really taste the flavour of food and drink, most people also have a, an experience that for Northern Europeans, such as myself, has come to be known as the Provencal Rosé Paradox. And this is the fact that when you go on holiday to the Mediterranean in the summertime, the food and the drink taste absolutely wonderful. You're there um, in the south of France with your family, you're happy, you're relaxed, the sun is shining, the seagulls are squawking overhead, or whatever it is they do. Um, and that glass of, of, of Provencal wine tastes so wonderful, we're all tempted to bring some back. But when we open that same wine or eat that same food at home on a cold winter's night, it no longer tastes the same. It tastes disappointing. It's lost something. This is the Provencal Rosé paradox. What happened to the taste of the food and the drink between when we were on holiday and really enjoying it and when we got home? 
Uh, and I think it's two things really that are important. It shows both the impact of mood and emotion. None of us enjoy what we're eating and what we're drinking when we're in a bad mood, when we're fighting with our family. Um, and good moods make, makes food taste better. Uh, and the other part is probably the impact of context or environment or atmosphere on what we taste. And both of those things were, were really where I started working with and analyzing what the, some of the top chefs, some, what some of the top food designers were doing around food. And here you see Denis Martin, who was one of the first uh, two Michelin star chef from uh, Vevey in Switzerland. And if you go to his restaurant, um, it's a single service with about 36 covers uh, and you arrive at about seven o'clock and what you see it's just this sitting on the center of your table. No cutlery, no glassware, no nothing, just this plastic Swiss cow. Well, we are in Switzerland after all. Nothing will happen. Guests will come earlier later, but eventually everyone's sitting down and somebody gets curious as to what this object is on the table. Is it a salt and pepper shaker, Swiss style? Do you twist the cow? And out comes the, um, the seasoning. Uh, somebody will pick that cow up to look underneath to see what it is. And when they do so, they'll hear the mooing of the cow and they'll laugh in surprise because this cheap plastic toy is not at all what I expected to find in a Michelin starred fancy Swiss restaurant. And within a few moments, night after night, you have a restaurant full of laughing diners, tables full of mooing cows. The mood has been broken people are relaxed, they're happier than they were when they came in. And that is the point once the mental palate cleanser has been served when the first dish comes out from the uh, kitchen. Beautifully, intuitively designed, I think, to improve the mood, to enhance the taste of the food. Because if the pleasures of the table really do reside in the mind, not the mouth, then who cares about a, one of those traditional palate cleansers that cleans our tongue of, I don't know what, what we need to get our mind ready for tasting. The other part of that Provencal Rosé moment is, I think, the effect of atmosphere, the sounds, the smells, the warm air. And that was an insight that was then captured together with the chef Heston Blumenthal when we served uh, about 150 people at a conference here in Oxford, an art and science conference in 2006, uh, an oyster. And half the conference guests got to listen to the sounds of the sea, half got to listen to the sounds of farmyard chickens clucking. We asked them to rate the taste of the oyster, how much they enjoyed the seafood and how much, how salty it was. And the results showed uh, 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 the seafood tasted much better, significantly better, but no more salty with the sounds of the sea than with uh, farmyard chicken noises, restaurant cutlery noises or something else. And that insight then was taken by the chef into this dish, which has become the signature dish on the tasting menu of what has been for several years, the world's top restaurant, the Sound of the Sea seafood dish. Because when the chef realized how important sound was, he sort of said, ah, it's like a light bulb going off. Sound is the forgotten flavor sense. Sound is something the chef can use in the kitchen. That's not something I was taught at culinary school, but I get it now. Uh, and this dish, which comes with sashimi, seaweed, sand, foam, looking like the seashore, also comes to the table with an MP3 player with some earbuds. So you put those earbuds in, you hear the sounds of the sea. And what's remarkable about this dish is it's perhaps one of the first examples, I think, of technology being brought to the dining table. Um, when you put those earbuds in, diners stop talking, so suddenly they become much more mindful of the food that they are eating and a surprising number of people in print and in person will tell you how this dish was the standout dish for them and how this dish brought them to cry at the dinner table. And you think there's something very interesting and bizarre going on here. Seafood never makes most people cry, but something about this dish does. Uh, what is it is something we're currently working on that kind of came out of this interplay between the science of the senses and gastrophysics, the importance of sound to tasting, and how the chef and the culinary team could take that insight and put it into a technology enhanced uh, food experience. Okay. Um, and what appeared on the menu in the Fat Duck Inbury, so close to Oxford in 2007, has since kind of gone global in one shape, way, or form. Here we are in uh, Shanghai in ultraviolet, French chef Paul Pare's uh, Michelin starred eatery. He's perhaps one of the most techno advanced chefs around. 
you can see just one of the courses from his menu, um, a stuffed caper berry. There's a riff on fish and chips because the chef, although French, used to be unfamous in the UK. And his, when you speak to him, his moment when he realized he was, he was maybe going to be somebody was when he saw his name appear in the local newspaper in which a um, fish and chips were wrapped. So he's referencing that here, a dish that comes to the table looking uh, as it does. Uh, no worries, there are another 20 courses to go, so you won't leave hungry, I presume. It comes with the sounds of the sea, followed by the sounds of the Beatles, the quintessential British rock group. It has a British flag projected on the table, and it also has the British weather, so they say projected at scale on uh, the walls. And all this done so that the chef can serve his food exactly a point, but using technology and storytelling to do so. But for him, it's really all about the food, but it's the sound of the sea, the sound of the Beatles, the British flag, all there trying to create that Provencal rosé type uh, moment. Or here in London, we've got Joseph Youssef, you can see in the bottom right of the screen, and he's been running a gastrophysics chef's table, a 10 course multi-sensory tasting experience. And he's one of the chefs who's really interested in nudging diners to eat differently, to think differently about food. It's not just hedonic, it's not just enjoying yourself going to this restaurant. You should learn something about the senses, how they affect tasting, uh, and maybe try some things that you have not tried before. It was insects in the Mexico menu. And here we have a dish with some projection mapping on the table showing the uh, oceans. You can see some headphones on the table, the all new 21st century item of cutlery for those interested in sonic seasoning, perhaps. Some tweezers rather than a fork. Uh, and what diners were eating in this case was this uh, jellyfish, something that um, most Western Consumers go, ugh, jellyfish? That's like disgusting. Very popular in Asia, of course. Uh, the oceans are getting fuller and fuller as global temperatures rise of jellyfish. But what are we going to do with them all? Well, why not eat them? When you prepare them, then they have uh, no real taste. It's just a pure texture. Uh, and so this dish is served on the tweezers. There's the jellyfish wrapped up with a uh, cucumber, uh, kind of espacho. And uh, at the same time, you put the headphones on and what you're gonna hear is a soundscape carefully designed that has both the sounds of the sea where the jellyfish were floating before they made their way to your table, but interspersed in that soundscape, you also have the sounds of crunch. And sometimes you crunch and the, uh, and you hear nothing. Other times the headphones crunch and you don't. And that sometimes you crunch and you hear a crunch. And again, something really interesting happens here. People come away going, wow, jellyfish is really nice. I never thought about it like that before. And hopefully if we can, if we can control that first multi-sensory tasting experience, make sure it's a great one, people will be more likely to try this food thereafter. Uh, but also what happens, again, you have the headphones on, so diners are silent for this course. Um, and there's this kind of constant segregation and integration where you sometimes integrate with what you're doing biting into the crunchy jellyfish with what you hear happening over the headphones. Sometimes you segregate those things. It's integration and segregation back and forth in a way that really captures your attention and draws you into the dish. Taking the gastrophysics science then to design a beautiful, tasty, multi-sensory experience that may help nudge people uh, into a better uh, direction. Now, people, chefs like uh, Heston Blumenthal and uh, Joseph Yusuf are certainly not the only ones, nor Chef Paul Paré. Uh, there are others like Paco Roncero in um, Ibiza. And here you see just four of the courses, uh, four of the environments in which diners are placed as part of a, the world's most expensive 24 course dining um, experience, 1500 euros ahead or something last time I looked. And I really bet that the same food would taste radically different. Well, significantly different, should I say, depending whether you're in the gates of hell deep under sea, in Central Park, or high above the clouds. The problem is I can't do the experiment to prove it, because a quick power analysis, which is what all the psychologists have to do these days, tells me I'd need 60 diners at least to get a significant result. 60 diners at 1,500 euros each is just something I cannot 
nor what can my department afford to do? So I think while some of these top chefs are really taking all the senses on and off the plate and using them in some really creative ways, uh, we have to rely on their intuition to know whether they're doing it correctly or as best as it can be done. So for us uh, who are interested in how the environment affects us, not just what it looks like, or what it sounds like, but what it smells like, what it feels like, all of those together, then we've had to go to a different direction in order to test our hypothesis of how much the environment matters and whether multi-sensory environments are more important than unisensory ones. So for us, we've worked uh, very often with brands um, such as, in this case, with uh, the Singleton uh, whiskey, uh, and we had 500 people in a uh, gunmaker's studio in Soho in 2013. Uh, we took them in groups of 10 or so around the three rooms you see on the right of the screen. Um, and they had to rate with a scorecard, like a little postcard, the grassiness on the nose of the whiskey, the sweetness on the palate, and the texture of the aftertaste of the whiskey. Uh, they took the whiskey, the scorecard, through those three rooms over a course of 15 minutes. They started in the grassy room at the top with grass on the floor, deck chairs, the sounds of um, the English summer, the birds tweeting, the lawnmower, the bowing of the sheep, uh, green lights, plants, croquet hoops, you name it. Uh, they then took their scorecard and whiskey to the second room, middle, with this, what I want to call sonically sweet music coming from the ceiling, um, with sweet colours, the pinks and red, sweet shapes, which are round. Um, and again, they rated the whiskey on the nose, the taste, the aftertaste. And finally, they ended up in the woody room at the bottom with uh, wood on the wall, stressed wood on the floor, um, dead tree, and everything woody sounding we could think of. Wood fires, wooden instruments, creaking wood doors, you name it. For a third time, our 500 people rated the smell, the taste, the texture of that whiskey. Um, and the result was that the environment in which they found themselves significantly affected the taste, the aroma, and the aftertaste of the whiskey. Higher in the grassy room, sweeter in the sweet room, and more textured aftertaste and a more enjoyable experience in the uh, woody room you see at the bottom. So this was the sensory, and luckily the first time we did like a, a total multi-sensory experience design um, and amazed to see how it worked and it worked so well. And even those who said, you know, I knew what you were up to, you were trying to make me say grassy in the green room, weren't you? Even those who said that didn't come out with their scorecards all in line, being uninfluenced by the environment. Sometimes they went the opposite way, but averaging over 500 people, it was clear that they were impacted by the environment that we placed them in. And that goes on to a number of other studies now using di all different kinds of sounds and visual cues, shapes, textures to bias the taste of, of various foods and drinks. Uh, I want to switch now just to look at a little bit of the work with uh, Joseph Yusef from Kitchen Theory. Here we see part of his synesthesia dining concept. Uh, this was the amuse bouche served called the Four Tastes. A dish that would come to the table uh, and every diner would be, receive four of those transparent spoons each with a different coloured spherified uh, ball of liquid. So you can't smell the liquid. You don't know what it's going to taste like until you actually put it in your mouth and it bursts. Um, and here we can see them blown up. And uh, it was really nice for us. Uh, it was all about the colour of taste, hence referring back to the question you were asked at the beginning of the session. Um, the diners had these four spoons in a random order uh, and the waitress came in and said, this is the four tastes. Uh, the chef recommends um, that you start with the salty spoon, then have the bitter spoon followed by the sour spoon and make sure to end on a sweet note. Please rearrange your four spoons in front of you. Salty, bitter, sour, then sweet. She wanders away and diners are left wondering, well, but how do I know which spoon is which taste? No one's told me that. And that's the whole point of the dish to see whether you can, in some sense, taste with your eyes. Um, if you get the answer right, or as the chef intended, I should say, then you'll enjoy the experience more. If you get the answer wrong, you'll be pulling the Marmite face, but at least we will have created a memorable experience and one that will teach you just how important eye appeal and visual cues are to dish perception. In fact, here, 77% of people around the world will say that the salty spoon is on the left, 
brown and black are bitter, green and yellow are sour, and pink and red are sweet. So there's a dish where the experiment is really what diners do at the table. We can test this in the restaurant, we can test this online, and then feed the insights back for the design of optimizing the color of food products. But things get a bit more mysterious and perhaps a bit more interesting from the design perspective when you start thinking about the color of the plate. And in 2012, we worked with another of the world's top chefs, uh, Ferran Adria from El Bulli in Spain. And we served what looks like, and it is in fact a strawberry mousse um, to about 65 people at the test kitchens and restaurant in the El Bulli Foundation. Uh, everyone tasted the same mousse on the same day in the same place. Half tasted the mousse from the black plate first, half tasted from the white plate first, and then they switched over. We asked them how sweet, how flavorful, how much they liked the uh, strawberry uh, mousse. And bizarre that it was, it turned out that people said the dessert tasted sweeter from the white plate than from the black plate. About 7% more sweet, 9% more liked, and 13% more flavorful, something like that. So while you cannot literally taste the plate, this was the first one of the one of the first examples that the color of the plate can change the taste of the food. We kind of didn't quite believe it in 2012, but roll the clocks forward eight years, and now there are 40 or 50 published studies from around the world with different foods, with different audiences, showing that the color of food, color of the plate does change taste. Um, and we've taken that sort of idea uh, in various directions, not just color of the plate, color of the bowl, color of the can, color of the package. We're here with Fabiana Cavallo from Brazil, um, a philosopher, but also an expert in coffee sensory analysis. We've been uh, giving coffee experts, baristas, Q graders, roasters, growers, and so on, as well as regular consumers, uh, different coffees to drink from the four cups you see here. And even before you lift that cup to your mouth, your brain has made a prediction of the likely taste based on the color of the cup. The pink cup primes notions of sweetness for most people. The yellow and green cup look a bit acidic and sour relative to the others. And when we ask people, what do you expect the coffee was going to taste like before they taste, we find that indeed the pink cup does lead to greater expectations of a sweet tasting coffee. The green and yellow cups on the right uh, of the graph led to increased expectations of sourness or acidity. Then when we actually taste the coffee, those expectations are carried through to what you actually experience uh, in the coffee itself. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing depends both on the coffee you're tasting, uh, African or uh, South American, for example, um, but also on your preferences, because some of us like sweet coffee, some of us like it more acidity in our brew um, but whatever you prefer what the evidence shows a mounting amount is that cup is part of the experience it's part of the design in a way uh, and I think we're starting to see now for the first time this is where our next speaker I think it's going to be so exciting to see how designers are taking some of these findings from the gastrophysics and science lab and incorporating them as a constraint in their creative practice uh, and here we see just one example from a uh, plate maker, Potter from the Midlands, Raiko Kaneko, uh, and she made these three plates for a project with Neff, which is some of the world's first perception enhancing sculptural ceramics, we want to rather grandly call them. A plate on the top left, which is for dessert, um, incorporating round shapes, pink colors, both cues to sweetness. Uh, the plate on the right is for seafood, blue and white of the waves or the ocean. And on the bottom left, a plate for Thai green curry that is designed to be held in the hands, that is very rough on the underside, and that is based on research that we have done to show that feeling sandpaper or rough textures can bring out the pungency of ginger, say, or perhaps gal and gal in a Thai green curry or a ginger biscuit. So these plates have been designed in order to enhance the desirable attributes of food. And I want to say that you, you, know, you can't really think about food without thinking about how it's presented, nor can you think about uh, what food is going to be presented in or from without thinking what the food will be. These two are kind of synergistically connected, but have been sort of treated as separate for, for, for so long. Um, and beyond that, beyond the colour of the plate, the colour of the cup, the colour of the package, there is also the kind of more... Uh, 
design elements of artistic plating. And here we see uh, one plate from a Israeli restaurant now closed uh, that is designed for gastro porn, for food porn, because after all, the sight of our favorite food when we're hungry, nothing gets our brain more excited than that, leading to more blood flow in the body's most bloodthirsty organ. Here we have a plate designed to avoid camera wobble because you can hold your mobile device in the slot on the left uh, and with a curved back to the plate so that you don't have to see any other diners. You get your perfect astro porn image every time. Uh, is this the future? I'm not so sure. As I said, the restaurant has closed. Um, but what I think it does hint at is the importance of gastro porn, food porn, these being some of the most searched for terms on the internet and linking back almost to uh, thousands of years ago to the little claim um, that from Apicius, uh, Roman gourmand, uh, that we eat first with our eyes. He said it a long time ago. Is it really true? Well, that was the question we've been working on with a number of chefs, including for the first time here, a young uh, Franco-Colombian chef called Charles Michel, uh, who was in New York and saw Kandinsky's painting number 201, that we see on the left, on the right of the screen. Uh, Kaninsky, kind of a synesthetic artist, uh, was trying to communicate uh, emotion through color and form. And the chef thought to himself, well, aren't I an artist too? And isn't what I want to do with my food experience communicate emotion to my dining guests? That led uh, to the development of the dish you see on the left, uh, the Kandinsky salad. Uh, 31 element salad, so kind of healthy stuff, uh, beautiful to look at, served on a painting canvas. Does it taste better than the same ingredients just tossed in a lazy salad? Well, here we see the first bit of testing. The chef on the left, maybe you've seen him on the um, Netflix's The Last Table. You get to the semi-finals last year. You can see 12 Kandinsky's ready to go on painting canvas because you are eating a painting after all. Notice the paintbrush on the right you eat this dish with the all new cutlery. If you are eating a painting, so what better to eat it with than a paintbrush? Make sure it's well washed first. It really seemed to matter for us when we tried this dish. Uh, beautiful food did seem to taste better. And when we followed up in the lab, but also then in uh, a dining room with about 100 and something diners at Somerville College here in Oxford, we served a Kandinsky inspired uh, version of the dish on the left to half the diners the tossed salad on the right to the other half of the diners. And we asked everyone, how much would you be willing to pay for a salad like this in a place like this? And you can see at the bottom are more than doubling in the willingness to pay for the same ingredients when you artistically plate the food as shown on the left. Is it just that the food on the left looks like it covers more of the plate? No, uh, we've tested that too, although that is itself important. Is it just the effort that goes into plating on the left? No, we've tested that too because if you arrange all the ingredients side by side on the plate, so which is effortful, so they look like soldiers, but it's not artistic or aesthetically pleasing, people don't like that much. And clearly there's a cost here to, to, to artistic plating. Somebody's got to spend the time making those plates beautiful, but then the restaurateur can do the math to figure out whether it's worth his while or her while uh, to make food beautiful. Same holds true, I should say, for, for artistic, um, for latte art on top of your coffee. We've worked with the world's top barista to show that people will pay more and enjoy a coffee more with latte art than without. And here um, we see another beautiful bit of, of gastro porn, uh, just to illustrate the way that we're sort of testing these things currently in the last couple of years. This with a Sao Paulo chef, uh, Albert Landgraf, his signature dish, dish three onions with tap, some tapioca foam and spume and stuff. And when I see that dish, what strikes us, it's all over the internet, um, is how the, the chef has arranged the onions in, they all point the same way and they all point away from the diner. And we've interviewed the chef saying, why did you do it that way? And he says, I thought about it, it's not random. Um, that's the way it goes, it just felt right to me. But is that enough? It just felt right to me as the designer of the food that that's how they should be plated. Well, with the chef's permission, we took his dish, put it on the internet, uh, and then invited people from around the world to spin the chef's plate and say, if you were going to the restaurant tonight, how would you like this dish served? Um, and for about six cents a head, 
people will respond, not randomly. Uh, um, here we see after about an hour, we've got 250 people where each dot in this rose diagram, uh, the more dots there are, the more people preferred that orientation. Wait a couple of days, we've got two and a half thousand people and clearly the chefs got it more or less right this time. Uh, two and a half thousand people say the onions should point to four minutes to past 12. Uh, the chef put them at 12 o'clock exactly, close enough not to matter. But the important point is how the science here can help the designer to test their intuitions and assumptions and check whether those they intend to serve appreciate the disc, dish optimally as they uh, hope. Good, good, good. So um, moving on a little bit to, to uh, combining then food art on the plate with the atmospheric sounds we've seen so far. What strikes me as a psychologist is how many of the textbooks are full of amazing illusions. This one visual illusion that's been in the psychology textbooks for 70 years, a picture of a Dalmatian uh, sniffing the leaves in the grass. Most people, when they see this image for the first time, uh, can see nothing, it's just noise. But at some point, the dog on the right of the screen pops out. And once you've seen the dog in the picture, you cannot unsee it. Your brain has changed. And even if you don't see that dog for another 50 or 60 years, as soon as you see this image again, you'll see the dog. There's a sudden emergence, as the Gestalt psychologist called it. Uh, and I presented this to the chef, Joseph Youssef, one day saying, now, wouldn't it be great if we could have an illusion in the mouth, an illusory taste experience? Is it possible to design that? He went away, thought about it, and came back about two months later with this dish, which has been served to diners in London. It's called a Picasso dish. Hopefully I you can see it on the right. Hopefully you agree it looks uh, beautiful. Um, but before the dish comes to the table, uh, the chef comes out and, and story tells to his guests. He says, this is the Picasso dish next. It's your one meat course. Uh, Picasso was an artist who said every act of creation begins with an act of destruction. And I, as a chef, that resonates with me because I take beautiful ingredients and I chop, I dice, I slice, I mash them in order for you to take my beautiful creation and destroy it in turn in order to savor the flavor. So eating, both preparation and consumption of food is involves multiple acts of creation, destruction and creation and so on. Okay, he says, I'm just gonna get to the kitchen to get you your duck for dinner. And diners hear this. Diners going, well, no, I'm not sure. Sort of, they laugh and feel a bit uncomfortable, but that's the point here. It's kind of the sound of the sea taken to uh, animal protein, and we want the chef wants the diners to think carefully about what happened to their meat before it made its way to the table. And if you're not comfortable knowing where your animal, what happened to the animal you're eating, should you be eating it in the first place? The dish is then brought out as you see it, and people say, and he will say, you know, can you see anything in the plate? And initially, only four out of 100 diners could see the image in this plate of food. After a few minutes, uh, suddenly 96 out of 100 could see. If I cover up the left side of the food with the duck and the microgreens uh, and replace it with a reflection of the right, hopefully you can see that what we have here is Pablo Picasso, hence the name of the dish, staring out from the plate with his beady eyes, his bald forehead and his white nose in the center of the screen. And you can sort of hear around the dining room, people go, ah, yes, now I get it, telling each other. And they have that aesthetic aha that enhances the experience of the dish and their voluble aha becomes a data we feed into our studies. Those who say, yeah, I can see it, they can't really see it. It's only when they go for the aha, they really get it. And once you've seen Picasso, I think you can never unsee him in the plate. And yet there's this, this, this discrepancy between those who can see and those who can't see and the changing world one has afterwards. So just to finish up, because I guess I must be running uh, about on uh, time here, I'll give you the final example of uh, a dish. This will be much more uh, chef friendly, but again incorporates the uh, art, idea of art on a plate, uh, sonic design, sonic seasoning. Uh, but also with a bit of nostalgia as well. 
And this is the duck rabbit dish. So the duck rabbit is another visual illusion uh, that's been around since the 1890s. The images you see on the left, hopefully you can see, are either look like a duck or they look like a rabbit. Uh, when I showed this to the chef, he also went away. And, you know, duck and rabbit are reasonably sustainable animals. We should all be eating more of them. Uh, duck and rabbit also go to well together in terrines and in dishes and in food. So that works well. So this is probably the most chef-friendly visual illusion ever. He came back with the plate that looks like what we see here on the screen. These are 12 versions of the duck rabbit dish, uh, early prototype. And uh, what we did is we want at the dining table for half the diners to see a duck in their plate, half of the diners to see a rabbit, and that will create discourse at the dining table. What do you mean you see a duck? I see a rabbit. If everyone saw a rabbit, there'd be no, no one would realise what's going on. And what we've done here is we've taken his dish, put it on the internet again, and changed the alternation of the pointy bit to find the optimum orientation for this dish to be served such that people are maximally uncertain whether it's duck or rabbit. Uh, once we found that online with about 500 or maybe 600 people, that was then how the dish was finally served to guests in the restaurant at Kitchen Theory in London, the duck rabbit dicks dish called Jastrow's by Stable Bite. Because so our hope was here that if you see a duck, maybe this dish tastes like duck. If you see a rabbit in your plate, maybe it tastes like rabbit. And as you stare at the duck and the rabbit and what you perceive will alternate back and forth, first duck, then rabbit, then duck, then rabbit. Um, would that then change the taste of the food in your mouth? And if it did, we'd have the world's first flavor changing dish. Um, combining that dish, which is alternating visually on the plate, we also had this soundscape. Talking of ducks and rabbits, ducks and rabbits, ducks and rabbits. That's alternating back and forth at the same time. And the final element is we projected on the table, uh, the Looney Tunes characters, um, and by so doing, hopefully then uh, triggering a sense of nostalgia, of childhood, of happy times, and all of that brought together in this dish that once again is designed to make you think differently about your food, that incorporates the science of the mind of the diner, taking in this case a visual illusion to try and create a flavour changing dish. And whether it does or not, I don't really care in the end. Well, I do care, but it doesn't matter in as much as if the flavour, if the dish does change its flavour, that would be magical. Um, and we'll have got there through the combination of the science and art, the design of food experiences. If the taste doesn't change as your visual impression does, then that's of interest to me as a, as a basic scientist to say, our flavour experience is different from the other senses um, in some interesting ways. So I will uh, stop there because I think I am at about time, but hopefully I have given you a sense of how a psychologist um, who is not a chef nor a designer can work fruitfully with both plateware, glassware, cup designers, experienced designers, environment designers, even architects, um, together with chefs and food and beverage producers and brands in order to create more intriguing, more enjoyable uh, food and beverage experiences that engage all the senses both on and off the plate, if there is the plate at all, and how we can use those experiences trialed some of the world's top restaurants but hopefully use them to nudge uh, people around the world no matter what cuisine they prefer to enjoy to eat a little bit more sustainably in the months years and decades ahead thank you thank you professor uh that was mind expanding uh thank you for sharing all of this fascinating research with us and we're right on time, actually. I would really like to remind the audience to please type their questions on the chat. And um, for now, I will hand over the mic to the lovely Laila Snevele. It will be great to get introduced to, to your work in the light of what you have just learned in the previous presentation. So a very warm welcome to you. Yes, thank you very much. I uh, hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Yes, I will share the screen with you.
perfect we can see it yes very nice uh so hi everyone uh my name is laila snevele i'm a sensory uh, food designer um so uh, within the field of uh yeah the new broad field of food design uh i have found uh, like my 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 personal fascination for our senses um to understand how we perceive food and the elements uh, that we can use to make our food uh, healthier. Um, I see our senses as a free resource that we are not using uh, the full potential of. Um, by that I mean um, that all of us are equipped with uh, the tools to process information uh, that we receive from the food, uh, but we don't fully understand uh, what are the best possible ways to trigger them. So my question is how far can we go uh, with this idea? Uh, can we taste with our eyes, uh, ears, uh, touch and smell? Um, and can we forget about added sugars and salts in the future completely? Um, in my work, um, I'm exploring many applications uh, for the research. Uh, research that I was uh, first inspired from reading Charles Spence uh, book, The Perfect Meal. Um, so thank you for sharing the knowledge and inspiring people, uh, a lot of people around the world. Um, yeah, and uh, during my presentation, um, I will take you through some of my projects uh, the process that goes into uh, the designs um, and thinking as a food designer and let's find out uh, if and how we can taste uh, with our senses. Um, so we have the five senses available, um, smell, uh, touch, uh, vision, hearing and the taste. Um, yeah, and it's it's interesting this uh, these interconnections between them. So, uh, what we are smelling can influence what we see. What we see can influence uh, what we touch. Um, and uh, yeah, these connections between them uh, make the whole field very interesting, uh, and open opens up a lot of possibilities, and how all these other senses can. Uh, eventually uh, influence our taste perception. Um, so I find the sensory uh, food design somewhere in the middle of uh, all these connections. Um, a digital uh, seasoning project was my first, uh, yeah, kind of uh, touch into the field. Uh, it was my graduation project from Design Academy Eindhoven from the food non-food department. Um, so uh, I created these five uh, animations, um, uh, visualizing the five basic tastes. Uh, so from the left, it's uh, salty, sweet, sour, bitter, and umami. Um, and with the project, uh, I wanted to show uh, a possibility uh, how we can season our food uh, digitally. So. I hope it could be possible, uh, yeah, maybe in, in, the, in the future, if we could uh, efficiently use all the knowledge available and, for example, cornflakes, we can uh, shape them according uh, to the sweet taste uh, experience. We can add the flavoring and the texture, and then we could have a digital device next to it to, to add the, uh, the sweet taste to it. The same uh, for sour, for uh, some sodas to remove the citric acid uh, or salty for uh, chips, for example. Um, I will let you in in a little bit of a research. How did this, uh, this project uh, basically came together? Um, yeah, so basically it was gathering all the possible information I could think of about uh, each individual taste. Uh, so for example, uh, like salty on the left uh, and then it's bitter on the right side. Um, so just thinking for each of the tastes, what are the, what are the foods that we would immediately think of as salty or uh, bitter? Uh, what are some of the 
color com combinations, how is it uh, marketed uh, in the supermarkets, for example, textures, uh, feelings, how do we associate with each of the tastes? What are the uh, physical effects on our body? Uh, how is it found in nature, for example? Uh, the same for sweet uh, and umami taste and uh, sour. Um, on the on the right, uh, you can see. Uh, I was trying to understand where also the, the the color understanding and the association come from. Uh, so I just tried to uh, like take apart a lemon and uh, then uh, copy the colors of each part. So uh, the skin of the lemon, or is it the pulp, or is it the juice? All these separate ingredients to see. Um, maybe to get more information where our color associations uh, are coming from. Um, and during the process, I, I tried uh, different applications and different, yeah, what could this uh, visualization uh, be? And I tried different touchables that you could, uh, yeah, touch the taste, for example, or maybe you can lay in, in something with the whole body and experience the umami taste, for example. But somehow it never really made a connection with the tasting experience, with what's uh, going on in the mouth. So um, I just remembered uh, how, how I was uh, when, when I was a kid. Uh, it's, it's basically always, uh, but I remembered when uh, my sister would eat uh, cranberries or something sour, she would of course make the expression that it's sour, but uh, I would just unconsciously repeat uh, the expression and make it on, on my own face uh, without e even actually tasting the sour taste. So I thought that something might be, I, I should look more into the facial expressions and see if I can see, uh, if I can find more information there that could guide the direct, uh, the, the project and connect uh, more with the tasting experience and direct the, the final design, uh, yeah, to connect it more with the, with the taste uh, itself. So again, also just gathering materials, how, 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 this, how we would describe sour and then combining it with the, with the facial expressions and describing the taste with all the possible tools to narrow it down again. Um, so yeah, if it's more happy or if it's relaxed, um, uh, bitter of course, also very expressive uh, facial expression. And from all this research, I also got like some of like keywords, uh, and I tried to yeah put this li uh, some little uh, collages together to uh, yeah maybe try to create the facial expression of uh, eating sour, but then uh, using different tools. Uh, so uh, for example, for sour, I had I came up with the keyword. Uh, tension. So I was trying to visualize the tension that if you would look at this image, uh, you would just get a similar experience somehow and create the the uh, the face of eating sour. But uh, and then it could maybe connect it uh, to the eating experience. Um, yeah, similarly with with uh, sweet as a childish and happy. Um, I also tried this little, uh, like an experiment uh, for, you know, to understand the importance of color. Um, so I switched the colors of these two fruits. So a strawberry that we would understand nor normally as this red, um, yeah, very sweet fruit. I changed it to yellow, uh, yellow green colors. And then the, the lemon, I switched it to red. And I asked people to just quickly look, uh, look at these two images and just immediately tell me, what do you think, which one is sweet and which one is sour? And um, of course, with the, with the strawberry, it was easier because uh, we find in the nature strawberries green, yellow when they're uh, unripe and sour. So that's also where our color understanding comes from. 
Um, but with the lemon, people started to get more confused. They didn't know what to, what to really answer about it because there starts like this, um, uh, yeah, a little bit of discussion between uh, the color that you see and the image, the shape that you recognize, but it doesn't come together. So there, there was a little bit more of a, a conflict uh, to decide either it's sweet or uh, it's sour. Um, but eventually it came so together in, in these animations. Um, so I combined uh, the, 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 the most important uh, things that I thought um, that yeah, would describe each of the tastes uh, yeah, to visualize it. And then I applied, I decided to use the, the facial expressions and apply the material on, uh, on, on this head. Um, and I will play you uh, these uh, sweet and sour. Yeah, so uh, for the sweet taste, I put together more of this uh, yeah, image of relaxing and happy, soft, uh, of course, the color. Uh, but then for the sour, uh, yeah, different. Um, so yeah, and uh, it's been really interesting since the, since the project is up. Uh, the project has been uh, traveling different exhibitions and I've worked with uh, many chefs to explore uh, what, this, uh, what can this visualization do. And um, yeah, sometimes it's interesting to see um, when people see these animations in front of them they somehow think that um, it's gonna react on, on you. So people always try to do something, something to make the animation react on them. But uh, this time uh, it's the other way around and we react and we are getting influenced by what we see on the screen. Um, so here, uh, yeah, this was in uh, Ludo and Hedo in Amsterdam. I uh, collaborated with the chef uh, Ola. So we created these dishes combining two, uh, two tastes. So like uh, bitter and sweet, uh, sweet and umami, salty and umami, and many others. Um, so uh, we would serve the dish uh, to the person uh, and show them one of the one of the containing taste visualizations. So they would start eating uh, the dish uh, with the sweet visualization, for example. And somewhere in the middle, we would uh, switch to a bitter visualization, for example. Um, yeah, so yeah, it was interesting to see that uh, we had some very skeptical guests that uh, didn't think that something can, that it's only happening in the mouth and the food is what it is instead of uh, some things around it that can influence the, the, the tasting experience. And people could really notice that, um, yeah, we can increase one or the other taste that is present in the, in the dish. Um, so that's basically how it works. Uh, it, it doesn't create a taste out of, out of nowhere, but we can uh, increase or decrease uh, one or the other uh, tastes that are already pre uh, present in the in the dish. Um, this uh, digital seasoning uh, this year is also in the White Rabbit restaurant uh, with the 
yeah, the great uh, chef Vladimir Muchin in Moscow. Um, so he created this, uh, I believe it's uh, fermented apple sorbet uh, dish and we present it uh, closed and we have the QR code on the top. So people scan the QR code that leads them to the, to the sweet and sour visualizations. And while they're eating, again, we have the, the switch of, of the two uh, visualizations. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, in this case, it's interesting for a restaurant setting that it's the guest almost takes part in uh, deciding if the dish, uh, dish should be more sweet or more sour. Because, uh, of course, they try at the beginning one and the other. Uh, but eventually, to finish the dish, uh, they can uh, stay with, with the one that they prefer. Um, and yeah, in, in the restaurant setting, I mean, the, the phones, the mobile devices are present uh, anyway. So in this case, I think we are just adding something to the dish instead of uh, taking uh, away from it, taking away the attention from what is what we are actually eating, but uh, yeah, trying to, to use it in a, in a better way and add something. Um, uh, the digital uh, seasoning last Dutch design week uh, was also updated uh, 2.0 version. Um, where I created uh, these two uh, multi-sensory uh, tasting rooms. So we uh, uh, divided uh, functional, uh, functional food and the sensory experience. Um, so at the beginning, people could get this um, uh, mm, astronaut food. Uh, how do you uh, would call it, Soylent, um, which is purely functional. It has everything that your body needs. Uh, you can just drink, have it as a meal, you mix it with the water and uh, you're good to go. But it's lacking the sensory experience. So we were trying to, um, yeah, provide and show, uh, yeah, what each of them uh, does and people could yeah, make the mix and then go into the uh, two different rooms and taste uh, yeah, the, sweet, uh, the sweet taste. They could see the digital seasoning uh, visualization and smell, hear and touch the taste. And also the same for sour and then see if, if uh, yeah, the tasting perception uh, changes. And yeah, with traveling and presenting this project is, uh, I think the most interesting part for, for people to, to understand is we might know that there are these outside influences uh, that change the perception of our taste, but we never really notice them. Uh, and with this, uh, yeah, with, with this project, people usually, it's you're having the same uh, food um, and you can just take a seat at one and take a seat to the other and really see next to each other uh, how much uh, does all these influences can uh, can change uh, what you're tasting so that's really like an eye opener for for yeah all the guests that there is actually something happening um, yeah, another way um, how, how I tried also, what can I do with it? Uh, I made it for a Nemo Science Museum in Amsterdam. Um, so I took, again, the five uh, basic tastes. And um, so I made the, the touch, touchable object. Uh, so you could touch the taste, you could smell the taste, uh, and you could listen to the taste. So again, translating uh, one sense into uh, three other senses and see if we could, yeah, possibly which one clo uh, comes the closest maybe and if we could, uh, yeah, what would be better to instead, instead of using sugar, for example, uh, 
uh, what would work more uh, better if it's um, a sound, smell, or touch, or is it a combination of uh, all of the senses? Uh, for sensory tableware uh, project, uh, yeah, I was thinking about the plate uh, as a background for the food that we are eating. And I was just curious um, that we have these uh, plates in our everyday life, the white uh, background uh, since a couple of hundred years ago, uh, when the food was actually more flavorful and uh, tasty. But we still use uh, the same uh, plates today when, uh, yeah, with this uh, big mass production, the, uh, uh, the food is losing a lot of uh, flavor. Um, so yeah, I was trying, I was thinking how we can enhance more of this, uh, of the experience of the food of, of today that we are eating. Um, so yeah, I played, uh, played around if it's uh, like this textured plate that we can, it's like a take uh, to go plate that we can take with us and maybe go to the uh, sandwich shop and ask people to yeah, give the sandwich in this container and then we can lay it, uh, open it up or eat it, but then add something to the, to the, to the meal, manipulate it a little bit. Or um, yeah, while we eat that the plate creates a sound, maybe the, the, the dish, the food gets more umami or more bitter. Um, yeah, thinking uh, about all these, all the, all the senses. Uh, the plate uh, on the right, uh, it's like, yeah, this bubble that is served with no uh, other cutlery. So people would have to lick it. Um, so that's also questioning, um, yeah, how do we eat and why don't we, why do we use, uh, yeah, this cold cutlery to eat it uh, or the, the, the wobbly, plate and the fork uh, project works more with the yeah, surprise element and uh, thinking about, yeah, also why do we use um, these uh, standard plates and cutlery if we can make it more exciting uh, every day. And again, the foldable plate, but uh, yeah, in a different color, for example, uh, and yeah, more folded. Um, and this project, uh, last Dutch Design Week, uh, we collaborated with Untam Dinner uh, to create the experimental dinner experience uh, using also uh, some, some of these uh, plates. Uh, we we're playing with the social aspect and social dining. Uh, if, if you don't know the people you are sitting uh, across or people you're sit sitting next to and you're presented with these uh, different things you can do at the table. Um, so also the, the lickable plate uh, was presented um, and we had some very successful evenings where everyone was uh, happy to join. But then we also had some evenings when people just uh, refused. They said, I'm not going to do this. And uh, uh, if you're sitting together with your work colleagues or depending, yeah, your 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 uh, status or um, yeah, how much are you willing to do? And uh, somehow that licking is uh, I don't know maybe personal experience for someone, and no one. <laughs> some people just don't dare to lick something in public, like the some kind of uh, table uh, culture and what is acceptable and what is not. And um, the wobbly. Plate and fork is, of course, a great fun project for people. Uh, I think it's maybe something uh, similar to the, to the Swiss cow uh, project, because that's also just people burst in laugh when they, uh, when they start to interact with the plate. Um, so it's uh, presented on like this hard surface, the, the, the bowl and the fork. And when people want to start to eat, they they lift it from the surface, but the but the fork is actually wobbly. So people at first they need to 
understand what they're gonna do with this and am I really gonna eat uh, or is this just a prop? But uh, when they find, they understand that, okay, this, this is gonna be my tool. Um, yeah, they just really enjoy it uh, and it's really fun. And the dish, uh, dish is also very tasty and it just opens up a little bit more of the possibilities that, that yeah, the cutlery doesn't always have to be hard to eat, you know? Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I was very uh, honored to spend some time um, in this location in Rio, uh, where uh, uh, Museum of Tomorrow uh, invited me to uh, explore food on Mars uh, under their Hacking Mars program. Uh, so that was also another another way how to test uh, yeah this this information and knowledge of using sensors to uh, season our food to yeah this see see another scenario on that um, uh, so uh, SpaceX uh, expects to send the first uh, people living, staying on Mars uh, within the next four or five years already. And of course, it's a big question what they're gonna eat and what they can grow there and what they can harvest, what they can keep or what, how all this uh, eating uh, uh, will be organized. What are the possibilities? So I found out that uh, of course, the spirulina is a, uh, is a very, possible way and it's uh, comparably easy to grow and harvest. Uh, it doesn't need um, like pollinators like other crops. Um, so it's, it's, it's uh, one of the scenarios uh, that people could be eating on Mars uh, and it's very nutritious. Um, so yeah, I took that uh, as a base, uh, possibly together with the wheat that might also be uh, grown on Mars. And then applying, taking that as a nutritional base um, for the meals that people could be eating there. Um, and then applying uh, the sensory knowledge of uh, like 3D printing uh, the food in a shape and adding it a texture. Um, and then also uh, different cooking ways to give it, uh, make it more crunchy, make it more soft. Um, all these different also possibilities to if if there is a scenario that they might have to eat more or less the same thing uh, every day and then how we can change it uh, to make it more exciting um so yeah we would have then this uh sensory uh shape that yeah could be soft crunchy different shapes um, and then we can apply um yeah, in some some way, um, the other senses of uh, changing the color for the food, uh, we can add the add a sound uh, to change also the perception um, and some flavoring either some in in the food or we can uh, add it as a smell. Um, yeah, to make the experience uh, rich, uh, multi sensory. Um, yeah, and uh, the, the, the last uh, project uh, I would like to share with you uh, with the natural synthetic project, uh, I want to activate uh, your senses and curiosity for, for food. Um, our senses can tell us if, if the food is natural or if it's synthetic uh, by paying attention to it actually. I have created these uh, fruits that look natural, they taste natural, they smell natural, maybe they uh, feel natural, uh, but it's completely human made. Um, so if I would present them to you, let them taste uh, uh, to you and I would tell that, okay, this one is uh, natural and this is synthetic and this is natural. Uh, yeah, would you, would you believe me? that this is uh, how I call it, or um, would you try it um, and decide for yourself? Uh, try to 
to to taste uh, what is natural about it and what is maybe not so natural for you. Um, yeah, but basically with 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 all my projects, um, yeah, with this with this uh, especially, people tend to be um, very curious uh, if it's how does it taste, uh, what is it made of, uh, yeah, what is what 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 is it? Uh, because it's just something uh, no one yeah have it's not a fruit that you you have seen. Um, so people are very curious, but the point is to be yeah as curious about the food that we get from the supermarket, and you can always find something, something new, and just expose yourself uh, to uh, like a more diversity of different ingredients and play around and just train your senses uh, in a way that you can understand them better and uh, trust them more as well. Um, so yeah. Uh, basically, uh, that's that. That's what I'm doing, and it's it's all about trying different things that I can uh, I can think of and see see where we can end up in the coming uh, coming years, and maybe maybe we taste with our senses completely, and the taste taste is created in the brain, uh, and we don't need sugar, salts, uh, and all these other things in our daily life. Um, yes. Uh, you can read more about the projects on my website and and uh, Instagram to see upcoming projects and uh, and what's going on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Leila. That was so interesting, uh, especially that last project. I've been following your Instagram <laughs> and watching the videos of you eating these different fruits, and I was so curious to imagine how that tastes. Hopefully Amir and Lovis could um, organize something next year that is not online, <laughs> a, tasting. Virtual, a tasting session. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, your, your presentation really made me wonder if uh, digitization would be able to simulate an immersive sensory experience, similar to that that we have in the, in the physical world like when we interact with food. Uh, this is something that really uh, popped up when I was watching your videos, eating the, those fruits. And uh, I really wanted to ask you how you would imagine virtual tasting experiences to influence our perception to the pleasure and satisfaction of food in the future. Yeah, I, yeah, that's also what I'm, I'm thinking a lot about myself as well. But I think for today, uh, yeah, the digitalization, may, maybe it's not food digitalization, but it's just the, digitalization, the digitalization in a, in a bigger scale. And the thing is that most of the time it just, yeah, as I said, it takes away from these experiences. We are now watching TV while we eat, we are answering emails, we are checking uh, all these other social media uh, places. But we are just getting, yeah, distracted from we are, what we are eating. We don't even, yeah, a lot of times we don't even see what we eat. We just do 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 the job, uh, or something. So, I think, well, at least with what I'm doing, it's more trying to maybe the technology is there already. So maybe yeah, try to weigh how to squeeze in uh, the reality and. Uh, somehow add something to the food maybe yeah but that's all very very tricky because if you want to see your favorite show while you're eating uh, yeah what could you have uh, next to it that would influence your your taste perception and and increase something and make it uh, very uh, sensory but other than that I'm I'm just thinking what if what if uh, in the future we might the tasting could be technological on its own. Maybe we have like something connected to the brain and we can just choose between the color and we can increase the sweetness just by, I don't know, you know, something doing, doing in the brain. Um, so I don't know how, how, far, uh, how far it could go, but yeah, it's definitely something 
Yeah, definitely what I like about your work the most is that you show this perspective of digitization that um, encourages more mindfulness. So you are more present in the moment. You're curious and it really triggers uh, the person to use all of their senses. I think it's very engaging and there's a lot to explore there. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you for that. So a lot of interesting questions came in but I would love to take this chance to ask Professor Spence a question, if I may. And I imagine you've been asked this a million times, but I still want to ask it. Because um, to a great extent, I believe that on a deeper level, we know what's, what's good for our health and well-being. However, in the context of your research, I wonder how can we trust our intuition if sensory manipulation could easily alter our perception of what we are eating? So, uh, yeah, so I mean, the question about um, sensory manipulation or augmentation is one that comes up a lot. Um, and I think on the one hand, there is no, there is no true taste experience. I sort of believe that you always taste somewhere. And there's always a certain noise or a certain comfort level or a certain company or a certain color or a certain uh, so you never taste nowhere, and given you always taste somewhere, and that somewhere always affects what you taste, um, you can't really turn off everything else, I think, and just focus on the food. Uh, and then my, my sort of feeling is that for years, uh, I was working with companies like Unilever and others, and trying to say, well, if you change the colour of the plate, it changes the taste of the food. And they sort of say, go away, don't be so stupid. Um, I, I, it's ridiculous. How could it? Um, and that's the response we got for a long time. Or sonic seasoning, the same. Just that can't be true. How can music change the taste of food? Um, and when when the conversation switches to the question of, "Ooh, isn't this scary?" That's kind of a compliment, <laughs> a veiled compliment in some sense. I want to say that it says suddenly now people are taking the the approach or the science seriously. They believe that it could do these things. And then what? Uh, will the um, the McDonald's and the uh, I don't know who else the bugbears are. Will they use it to make us eat more burgers and such like? And that's definitely possibly true. But I think uh, the knowledge is kind of, you know, uh, it's, it's um, neither good nor bad. It's just insights or knowledge or understanding. And that can be used in both uh, by the big food industry to perhaps make us more, eat more of the stuff we shouldn't be eating more of. But at the same time, it can be used for a health perspective, which is why we've taken a lot of the findings, especially with people like Joseph and then try to work in um, hospitals in, 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 in uh, Spain for anti-cancer hospitals for children to try and use this sensory design to make them eat better and more through old people's homes as well um, to try and take the insights into a, a, a more positive direction through this kind of nudging people to eat different foods. Um, I think so ultimately the more that we know about the things that influence us, the better we understand the impact of all these factors, then surely that must put us in a better position to be able to, if not turn them off, at least acknowledge them and think about what they're doing and whether we're happy for them to be doing what they are doing. Okay, yeah. Thank you, thank you for that answer. Um, it's definitely powerful. And uh, I think this is one of the stances where ignorance is not bliss, so true. <laughs> and if you just think of it, you know, uh, as I, I was mentioning, maybe you can't, at present at least, turn water into wine through colours and shapes and textures and sounds and anything else. Um, what you can do is take a, something that already tastes of something and sort of tweak it and twist it and, and enhance it or, or suppress it. Um, and in that context, when people think, you know, everyone is drawn to sweetness, and you sort of started your question, well, I think we all know what we like, but maybe we like it too much. We're all drawn to sweetness. Um, okay. But if we know through sound or colour or, or movement, we can help to reduce the amount of sugar you need to get the same sweetness level. It's like, well, who wouldn't want that? We have so many questions lined up and we are already over time. I personally don't mind staying here for the night and I hope Amir would allow us to Absolutely. take all of the questions <laughs> in. <laughs> yeah, let's try to uh, gather them exactly and, and um... Yeah, try to answer as much as possible because all of them really are super interesting for Professor Charles and for Leila. So yeah, 
let's start. <laughs> okay, so we have a question that, we have many questions that came in from Milena. Um, I wasn't sure if they were addressed to Professor Charles or Leila. And if you would like to turn on your mic and, and ask your question. Yeah, so that like the, I think I'm just gonna ask maybe just one, the one, the first one I posted that was for Professor Charles. Um, Thank you. And which, which was kind of, I hope you can still hear me. Um, we can. Okay, great. Which is kind of like a simple methodological question, which was just, um, so when you, when you give people oysters and then you know, play the sound of the sea or the sound of chickens them and then ask them, you know, like, you know, what, what does the oyster taste like? Um, I was just wondering whether you, you kind of, were you, with, you know, whether you were worried that, you know, people were kind of knowing where you were getting at, that um, if you put like two associations that fit together, um, together, that actually this should enhance the, the taste in, in, some, in some, you know, desired um, direction. Um, same a little bit for the whiskey thing that you know if you put you know, if you have like some woody taste uh, to the whiskey that if you play you know the cracks of firewood or something that you would get like a specific taste of the whiskey out there so that would be like you know like if there's a methodological worry there um, whereas in the in the cases where you have this like uh, strawberry mousse I think mm -hmm. what it was on the like completely blank plates and people actually don't really have associations about how the color of the plate um, you know, influences, you know, how sweet the mousse tastes, you know, so that there you like, you kind of get a more neutral result because you don't have all the associations yep. and like the, the pre-knowledge going already. Yep. Uh, so that's definitely a fair question on one that the reviewers of some of the research when we try and publish it academically come up with, um, with uh, annoying regularity. <laughs> um, and I think it's true. And certainly from experience, when we first did the whiskey experiment, I wanted everyone to have a different glass of whiskey in each room. So you wouldn't know if it's the same whiskey or not. Because yeah. if you knew it was the same whiskey, why would you say something different? But practicalities meant we couldn't have 1500 glasses of uh, around. And in the end, that turned out to be part of the power of the experience, I think, was that people knew we hadn't taken that whiskey out of their hands and they could see what they had said. Um, and while as a psychologist, I kind of normally like just numbers and I don't ask, ask you don't ask psychologists don't ask people what they think because you get yeah, all sorts yeah. of answers. Just you know, give me a number from one to 10, how sweet or, or woody that yeah. drink was. Um, but in some of the things we've done, we've had a box just to ask people, how was the experience? So we did one with the Campo Viejo, a color lab where we changed the lighting and music to make wine sweeter or fresher. And in that case, um, the boxes were the really amazing thing. People saying, wow. Oh my God, I didn't believe it. As soon as you change the lighting, the taste changed. Mm -hmm. And that's somehow much more powerful in a way than the graphs I'm used to working with. Um, and I, I'm through working with some culinary artists like Caroline Hopkinson, when she took our bittersweet soundscapes we've developed and she served them as part of a dish on a menu. She then had people you know, dialing up on their mobile devices. If you want the bitter, if you want the bitter seasoning, dial this number. If you want the sweet seasoning, dial that. That's kind of leading you in again, as you say, sort of priming people. Mm -hmm. So I think ultimately both things exist. If you want to get the biggest impact on people, I think the underlying sensory stuff should be there and right. Mm -hmm. But if I lead you in the right way and I call it the right thing, it'll be even greater. Mm -hmm. um, but then when we're doing it for academic papers, we try and do it as so you have no idea what's going on. And so when we've done uh, some recent things where we've been in restaurants and there's just background music playing and maybe no one mentions it. Uh, but on one day, the background music happens to be playing spicy music and you're getting a spicy dish on other days. And in that case, even then, when nothing's been drawn attention to, sometimes, sometimes at least, these things still have their impact. And so then says, you know, that that's, there is a fundamental influence there as well. But yeah, right to be worried. Um, Thank you. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, thank you for your interaction. Um, so we have a question that says, were the observations at the Singleton experience used by the brand to advance their product in any way? And that's uh, yeah. addressed to you, Professor sure. Spence. Um, so I think, yes, so actually the, the, the history behind that was, um, this is the first kind of multi-sensory tasting with the public that had been involved in and the whiskey company have their experts, their sensory experts, crusty old men, we imagine somewhere in Scotland in Elgin. Um, 
and they've always they've they've been the arbiters of taste. So each year when the new batch comes, they try and match that taste to the taste of the brand. And each year the, the raw materials are a bit different. But that's always you know how could you trust the general public to tell you what to do? You need the experts who've been trained. Um, and so it, it took a long time to get over that mindset within the company and say no, let's just do this experience, which was sort of sold in as a marketing exercise. We'll get exposure to the brand. It wasn't about learning anything about the taste of the product and yet um, when the when the whiskey makers came and experienced it themselves and when they saw the response of others and this has happened with the Campo wine when we had the winemakers come and they go wow as soon as we get back we need to change our cellar door experience because it really does taste different um, so I think while well, it was very hard to get these things started they had to a change in mindset uh, and one that I sort of support if you know I want to know what real people say about the taste of things not what the expert says should be the case and uh, so do they do things differently in internally when in many food and beverage companies it feels like uh, they still test products with highly trained panelists in rooms with red lights without the package without the brand name without anything and I go, all my research this says that's completely the wrong thing to do because we never taste like that. The red light's doing something for a start, the black tasting glass, you're by yourself. Uh, this is so unlike real tasting. That is just not the experience consumers have or that you want to understand. So stop doing it. But it's so firmly ingrained in so many food companies, I think that that's the way you do it, that they are slow to change or to give up that even when they start doing some more of these immersive testing experiences and using VR now a bit more to try and you know, take their panelists into a virtual coffee shop and see what they say about the new formula. Um, I would like to ask Andre to ask his question. Andre, Hello Professor awesome. Spence, how's it going? Good, good, thank you. Uh, I'm curious since uh, our experience is subjective and relies on memories and association and belief systems and whatsoever. Uh, is there a one size fits all kind of constructed experience, like culinary, culinary experience, that most people can, you know, have a consensus on how to experience it? I suppose that everyone would say that uh, they, they like sweetness rather than bitterness. Well, that's sort of hardwired in. Um, there's maybe the response to sweetness is, uh, is good and bitter and sour is bad. But then I guess we all learn through experience. Um, that all our, I think all our responses to smells of food and flavors and aromas, they're all learnt essentially because we like the smell of vanilla because it comes with sugar and fat and ice cream. Um, and we think of it as sweet. And so in that sense, we're all a product of our environments and our experience and hence our culture. And that might make you think, well, we can't do anything common. And yet, um, I bet you know, some of these, the shapes of taste, say, and the color of taste, um, I would bet that everywhere in the world, sweet is round. Um, I, haven't, I haven't got the proof of that, but wherever we have been, sweet is round. Um, and something like we find that you know, low pitched sounds are bitter for most people, whereas high pitched sounds are sweet. And I'm guessing that that should be universal because all babies, when they're born, stick their tongues out and down to eject something bitter tasting. And all newborns will stick their tongue out and get sweetness. Whether your tongue in those different places, you make different sounds. It's a stupid thing to do, but we all do it. Rats and chimpanzees do it as well. And hence that makes me think that maybe, you know, that bitter and low pitch will again be universal truth. Added to which, of course, there will then be some culture specific uh, and environment specific influences. But as a psychologist, we always think, you know, people are, are individuals are different. So how can you say anything? But then we say, if, if I can just say eight out of 10 of you think round is sweet, that's good enough for me. That's significant. And the majority of you will agree. <laughs> also, one more thing, one more question. If, um, if we want to use these findings and these methods for personal enjoyment for the mm -hmm. food, uh, how can, can you can you separate the mind, the intellect from interfering of sensory input? Like, would you still think that okay, I put this and construct in such such a way to feel that uh, taste? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be interfering a little bit in our experience of, of how spontaneous the experience should be? 
Um, I'm not sure if experience should be spontaneous always necessarily, um, <laughs> but you know, knowledge. If 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 if, if we have done one study with a um, a, a uh, Belgian chocolatier in his shop, and we got some music. Uh, and if we tell you that you know, the music is designed to make the chocolate taste better, it has less of an effect than if we say the chocolatier used this music as inspiration for his creation. Yeah. It's the same music, the same chocolate, but the cover story makes it things different. Um, and I think, in terms of you know, if 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 you know that the white plate should make things sweeter, does it actually? Or once you know what's going on, does the intellect intervene and say no? Um, and I think we can't know for sure without doing the research. And I'm sure some of these things may be a little bit more resistant, mm. will break down once you know about them. But I suspect many others will continue to work. That even if you know that the colour in your food is artificial, it's not the taste, you can't switch that off. Even if I tell you the colour is wrong, our brains are wired so the senses are connected, I think. And you simply cannot ignore, override, prevent all those years of experience and all that learning and all those connections from, from having their role. Thanks. Thank you, Professor. There's a question for Leila actually here. And it says, how can this research aid enhancing food packaging? And if implemented on the food packaging, cause a positive shift in the food experience? Uh, uh, packaging design, sorry, I wasn't full. Uh, how packaging design can influence the... Now, how can the research enhance mm. food packaging? Mm. And could it cause a positive shift in the food experience? Yeah, I've been thinking also to work on some of, uh, yeah, projects like that. Uh, but I think it's, um, yeah, it's always like a question how much, uh, yeah, do we use this packaging while we are consuming the food? Or is the packaging on, only to carry the food and then we just throw it out and we have the food, uh, food separately while we are eating? Um, so that's that's definitely something to uh, to take in account, uh, yeah, in a, in a project like that. But if it's if it's if the packaging is there to to be there while we are eating, if it's a can of uh, yeah a drink, or if it's maybe an ice cream cone that you eat on the street, then then definitely we can influence. But then also, yeah, it's just always so much information goes. Uh, in the product, uh, how do we use it? Where do we use it? Um, yeah, what should, is there any, any other function? Does it keep cold or I don't know. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, there's not one answer, but I think we can influence, uh, yeah, the taste of the, of the product if, um, if, if it's still around while we are eating, but if it's, if it's just to be on the shelf uh, to catch your attention, then it it has nothing to do with uh, influencing the perception. I think that's true, and I think packaging, at least to me, plays a huge role in expectation. Mm -hmm. And usually, yeah. especially when you have this grand packaging with amazing texture and a lot of information, sometimes mm -hmm. it's set for disappointment. <laughs> Thinking about the um, the strawberry and the lemon. Um, and the lemon that you've sort of taken apart with different colors from the outside to in. I suppose then if you think about a branded product like Coca-Cola, mm -hmm. most of us, I think, will probably think of the color of the packaging, not the color of the drink or both. Yeah. And yeah. Even if I don't know the packaging's there, I'm still in my head, I'm, I've got the image yeah, of the just, outer layer. Yeah, it's just connected. It's, it's either some people just think of the drink, some people think of the can or... If you see the color, uh, you might immediately think of the drink and one another. Some, yeah, like some some of these brands is just so deep in the in the okay. in the co conscious subconscious that uh, yeah, we cannot really take apart these two. Uh, I'm gonna ask a question. Of course. <laughs> Can I jump in? <laughs> I'm not on the list. Sorry. But, um, when, it, when you had your um, playing at the border between uh, natural and artificial. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, could, do you think there's a space to play between um, sort of animal and plant? Yeah. As well? Mm -hmm. That's a, a, a stronger dichotomy almost of, I don't know whether that's 
get into more of an uncanny valley at the borderline of <laughs> yeah what what is it exactly no my goal was basically to just create uh yeah something more more of well in the end it doesn't really matter if it's if you perceive it as a fruit or an animal but it's just um uh, well yeah in some sense um uh, <laughs> but uh it's more just to give it as much as natural elements as I can. Uh, yeah, from my perspective, uh, perspective, giving, uh, giving it a color or a texture and then uh, eating uh, these fruits. Uh, on Instagram, there are videos of uh, eating them and then some, some of them uh, yeah, breaking apart and seeing the texture and what's going on. That it's not only... Uh, yeah, just the material, uh, but also taking in account, uh, seeing the shape and then thinking, how could a shape like this taste like what we would expect from a shape like this, what could be the texture and all these kind of things. So taking, uh, yeah, going back in a way uh, in the process. Uh, uh, struck by, uh, I'll stop after this one. Um, you were saying when you were looking what shapes were sweet and what textures and, uh, um, and colors. Then you sort of went on the internet and got, got a whole range of images. Yeah. And it was a designer's mindset to say, okay, what's that telling me? How do I interpret it? And I, I wondered whether there's some, actually something really interesting to be done here. That I, as a psychologist, I ask my subjects, what color is sweet? And they give me an answer. But really, if I could, I could probably interrogate the internet instead if I put sweet into a Google search engine. Mm -hmm. I could analyze the statistics of all the sweet things that came back. Yeah. Maybe that would be the kind of the bridge between your I know, design, intuitive approach. And, yeah. and I could then stop having to ask subjects anything. I could just go straight to the internet. And... <laughs> well, I mean, it was a combination eventually, because I, of course, I also had to ask uh, some other people, because, for example, I didn't really know how to, uh, how to describe umami myself. So I also asked, yeah, in, in school, I made like just service for people. How would you describe uh, each of the tastes and what are the first things that come in mind or choose from all these colors? What do you think is the most uh, sweetest of them all? Uh, but like, yeah, umami, for example, I think uh, it's very interesting because, I mean, in, in Europe, we don't have really this deep understanding of uh of this taste i saw also in the chat someone was asking uh, uh something about umami and why is it uh, one of the five tastes it's it's kind of ongoing question about uh, umami um but uh yeah in that sense it was interesting uh yeah especially for umami to see to understand it from kind of unknown point a little bit and then know what other people think and then of course I made the result uh, like the visualization in the end but uh, I got some uh, feedback from uh, Japanese uh, people and they said that they for them umami is more like sweet more close to sweet where my vis with my uh, uh, animation it I, I tried to make it kind of like more heavy and yeah it's it's hard to describe it but taking in account all the other information but some people some some people told me like from Japan that they know and they grow up with this taste um, yeah they 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 say that it's it's almost sweet it's so pleasant and it's it's the best taste you can get uh, it's better than sweet almost um, so I mean there's also some of the questions of the cultural uh, background as well uh, yeah just how much you know uh, about uh, each of the taste and what you can get get in but yeah the google was just to think of any any possible keyword around i don't know salty or what are the foods what are the all the products everything just to gather all the possible uh, information somehow about uh, the tastes It's really interesting for me to hear because um, when I was going through your digital seasoning series and uh, I went through the videos uh, because umami has been really intriguing, an intriguing flavor for me to understand. And um, I've lived some time in Southeast Asia and I also did in Europe. And 
to experience um, the meaning of that flavor was so interesting. And I finally arrived at that flavor being mm, the taste of satisfaction. Some people would say that it, it also uh, depicts the presence of protein in the food. And that is really interesting to think of because when we think of MSG and all these additives to the food in Southeast Asia, it, it goes um, to really enhance the experience of a food where you feel that it was, that there's this thick broth and in your in the in the videos you had i noticed that it was a face with like to me it seemed like it was a bubbling broth and i was thinking of ramen and 48 hour boiling <laughs> broth and that's what umami feels like but speaking of google I, I went there today because i was thinking of the poll and a very interesting question came up and i wanted to just shoot it at professor charles and it says what color does the number four smell like because i'm not going to be able to sleep tonight without an answer <laughs> um, <laughs> that's what happens when you go to google yep. i think <laughs> no, um well it's probably the number seven that most people think of and it's blue i think so i've been collecting some papers of just like these associations that um the magicians play with and they say, I want you to think okay. of a digit, I want you to think of a colour. Okay, you're thinking of, and that's based on the fact that as a population, we will not pick digits equally. Most of us will pick, or 60% of people will pick seven if they have to pick a digit. And something like 55% will pick blue if they have to pick a colour. So you can, you can get quite a lot of people that way. Um, so I could, I could tell you the colour of sevens, they're blue. <laughs> but for fours... Well, that's um, four. <laughs> <laughs> have to do the research, have to do the research, I think. Yeah. Uh, Would you like me to run the poll again? <laughs> Speaking With of that. the poll, <laughs> should we ask that question? <laughs> and I guess four is I mean, even, so maybe maybe even and odd numbers have different colours associated with them, perhaps? Even yeah, is more stable, yeah. I don't know, conservative, is it? Or ask a synesthete who has one of those uh, colour yeah. number emotion associations? Yeah, it's definitely square. Okay, someone has answered it's orange. <laughs> orange, orange. <laughs> brown wow i mean i guess it's sort of like they can then kind of kandinsky you know the shapes and colors matching the circle the triangle and the square and the blue yellow and red is that being again one of these kind of surprising associations that uh people have between shapes and colors and this is mm -hmm. then it's, what Lila and I'm doing it in some way, then just extending that across the senses. But for me, somehow it seems interesting that these cross sensory connections seem stronger. Whereas I think when we've tried to look what color should a triangle be, you can't really find a clear answer within vision. The mapping seem more arbitrary, but between them suddenly colors do have a taste, they do have a shape. Uh, and so why is it that our connections across the senses these almost synesthetic connections are stronger than within the senses. I've no idea why, but it feels like it's sort of true. It's so interesting. Did I miss any questions? Because I um, yeah. think I went um, over. There's the one from Manal and Imke and um, Winwood. Okay, yeah, some think, of them yeah. are have been already answered in different ways. There's mm -hmm. an interesting question that says, um, "How do you think gastrophysics will affect the way we eat um, when it comes to tools and cutlery? And how do you imagine the fu future food rituals changing according to this outside the world of fine?" Dining. Uh, I'm still trying to get my head around the wobbly fork. <laughs> quite happy what I do with that. Maybe dip it in the sauce and then dip it in the green stuff. And um, uh, but uh, I do think cutlery is just like the plateware. Really, is one of those really interesting things that, uh, as Leo said, it's the American white plate, the large white round plate that 90% of you know IKEA plates are sold are, are American white plates. Um, 
and for cutlery, why in the West is it everything that comes to our mouth comes through a fork or a spoon? And yet until 2012, um, there was never ever a published scientific study of what that cutlery does to us and the taste, even though every food, the same with the glassware, apart from the world of wine, no one's ever studied what's the impact of the glass on the taste. They study the drink, but not the receptacle. They study the food, but not the utensil. Um, I think it's always part of the experience. Uh, so it's weight matters, it's material properties, it's color, it's texture, all these things. Um, so I imagine that there still will be utensils, um, but what they will be like, I'm not sure. Um, and I just think that you know they'll be designed maybe for. Would we? Is this something that's so important that we'd like to have our own ones, rather than taking the cutlery that's been in? I don't know how many other people's mouths in the restaurant. I, like in the good old days, you bring your knife to the medieval dining table. Um, but I think you know what we'll see in the future will be, and I'm starting to see it more designers and cutlery makers uh, who are now trying to design and create functional utensils unlike things we've seen before. And Chef Joseph in that picture of the jellyfish, he was using tweezers as one example. He also has a, 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 um, a leaf that's made out of like silver used to cut rather than a knife. And I've seen various sort of design probes at some of the design schools with people reinventing what cutlery might be. Um, so I think there'll be a lot of innovation. Maybe we'll look back in some years and think, why did no one ever think? Why did we, no one think the, the three pronged fork wasn't the best thing or? It's definitely an interesting topic and we can go on for hours. Uh, I'm amazed we already went 30 minutes overboard and uh, thank you so much for your time, for the interaction from the audience. Um, it's been really great. Thank you, Laila and Professor thank Charles. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you for sharing your work and your research and uh, um, it's hard to say goodbye. I would say our questions are still coming in and comments. Amir, we need uh, <laughs> we need a spin-off of this session. I'm, I'm, I'm not going away. I'm just I'm enjoying it to the last minute. I, I'm, I'm happy to stay another hour. <laughs> you all agree. <laughs> Maybe we can close with the poll again and see if anything has changed in that regard. Yes, let's do that. Um, you can choose more than one answer and here it goes <laughs> oh my god that looked good <laughs> <laughs> yeah for a moment there mm -hmm. So we have believers in the sonic seasoning with 94%. <laughs> I think there's been a change. Yes. So 11 people to go. Spaghetti with their hands. How interesting. Yeah, I, 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 I never 1700s, the famous painting oh. of the uh, spaghetti episodes of Napoli. <laughs> Danilo Spiga says no. <laughs> but we can try. How are the results? So I'm going to share them. Hmm. Okay, sound at 84%, but there's definitely an, a huge difference than when we started. Hmm. 
Awesome. I'm trying to keep up with the comments. I don't want to miss anything. This has been so interesting. Lila, can we can we can we can we can we borrow your stimuli at some stage to do some experiments? <laughs> <I> think yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, for me, it's also very interesting, this uh, very studied, studied research, I don't know, to track some uh, brain activity or something like that. I've all, always been uh, interested to find uh, possibilities to do that. Uh, yeah, I don't know, with some, some, some projects that, that's possible. Uh, just curious, what does this um, yeah, actual uh, yeah, data would register? but uh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I guess that's a wrap. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you yeah. want to? <laughs> like, I thought I would like be more strict with this. <laughs> yeah, my intention was to be really strict with the time and now I'm finding it really hard to wrap up. But I would really like to thank the audience for being here uh, with us tonight yeah. and for the amazing engagement. I would also like to thank uh, Professor Charles and Lila again. Thank you so much for your presence, for sharing the knowledge. And it has been an honor um, for us to have you both on one stage. Um, hopefully we will be able to have you in Jordan soon. Mm -hmm. And, <laughs> and um, yeah, I would also like to thank Amir and Lovis for organizing this and um, to remind our audience that uh, we have a really interesting talk next Wednesday at the same time uh, under the title Agri Meets Design. And uh, yeah, so thank you all and good night. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Aya. <laughs> thank you, Leila. And thank you, Professor thank Charles. You. Thank you thank um, for this yeah. wonderful um, presentation. We really enjoyed it so much. And um, yeah. Have a good evening and we hope to see you soon somewhere sometime. <laughs>